Hello students! Okay, hopefully by now you've had a chance to get onto Octave on Chesapeake and actually try out that load command and maybe even snoop around a little bit as to what this uh, temperature data from these cooperative stations in Nebraska looks like. Um, so now you should be able to load data into Octave and it's, it's kind of a lot of data. Um, the file that I've been messing around with in these examples has been the eight years of uh, cooperative temperature data. It's, uh, about 485,000 observations over the eight-year period. Um, when we do the project, depending on how much data I can get downloaded from the website, it might be 10 years, it'll be about 600,000 lines if it's 10 years, and so on. Um, obviously, though, at any given time, you don't want to be working with all of the data. You probably want to work with some subset of it. You want to know something about the temperature at some particular station, or maybe during some particular year. And so what we need to do is we need to have some kind of database operation so we can take this big archive of data that's stored in an array with the name data. How do we actually pull out just the observations we want to work with? Well, we're going to do some kind of database operations then. We're going to be saying how do we do operations on here that extract the data that we want. And as it happens, that's one of the things Octave does well, is it works with big data sets and it manipulates them and so on. And In fact, there's several different techniques depending on the kinds of data it is and how they're structured and so on. So we want to find a fairly efficient way to work with these fairly large files in Octave. And there are a number of ways we could have chosen to do it, but after doing some experimenting, I think the right tool for the job for Project 2 is a technique with the name logical indexing. Now, uh, I'll be honest, that logical indexing itself is a little bit complex and a little bit, um, boy, there's a lot of powerful things you can do with it. We're just doing one little thing with it, though. We're just going to be using logical indexing as our technique to extract just data that meets certain requirements, like just if the year is 2010, or just if the station number is station 8, or something like that. So, Let's say we want to just do something with the data. We just want to take out the stations that are in our data set that have um, identifiers at uh, the, where the station identifier is 25. I just want to take my eight years of data and I want to extract just the rows that correspond to observations taken by station 25. And I'm kind of just in a touchy-feely way trying to say that there on that bottom line there. I want to see the parts of my array called data in which I want to see any row in column one has a 25. So if, I'm not being very articulate here, but I, I just want to see the rows in that matrix data that have column one equal to 25. All the other ones that have different station identifiers, I don't care about them. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to be using a technique that Octave can do called logical indexing. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating a new array that will be kind of like saying true or false as to whether each row in our data array meets a certain requirement. Now, we're going to call this array IDX. Uh, you can call it almost anything you want, except strangely index, which is what I was going for here. All the examples that I saw when I looked online to learn more about this all used IDX, so we'll follow that pattern. I tried index, and it turns out index is a reserved word in Octave. It's a command that means something else. So, okay, we're going to make an array called IDX, it's our index array, and it's just going to have ones and zeros in it. It's going to have like zeros if, the, if this isn't one of the rows we want to keep, and one if it is one of the rows we want to keep. So, like, I'm going to have a command that looks something like this, IDX equals, and then in parentheses, I'm saying from data, any row, column one, if it's equal, equal to 25, oh, up, 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 up. remember equals equals? If you don't, go back to, what was that, module 3? Module 2? Module 3, I think. Whichever one it was that had, where we explained the difference. Remember, equals equals is a test. Equals is an assignment. It says, set, take the thing that's on the right-hand side and put it into the left-hand side. Equals equals is a test. Are these two things the same? So, any row in data where column 1 is equal equal to 25. So, what is, what's going to actually happen here is this IDX will become an array that has just ones and zeros in it. Is row one a row where column one was equal to 25? Probably not, so it'll be a zero. And then do the same thing for zero, column, uh, row one, row two, row three, all the way down to the bottom. Feel free to actually go in and, and, and um, 
when you do this in in, in uh, Octave and actually use the display to actually dis you know the DISP command to actually display this IDX variable is actually kind of interesting to look at it although it'll be mostly zeros. Um, but then once you have done that, like I have on this top line here on this slide. Um, then you just create a new array, which I'm giving the awkward name here of data underscore just underscore 25. So I'm saying like this is just the data I'm using for uh, 25, uh, station 25, is then equal to that array data index idx comma all the rows. So any row in index that was, a tr that was true, that was one, we're going to move it over into this new data just 25 array, all its columns. If all you do is memorize the pattern of this to make it work in your assignments, that will be fine. This logical indexing thing is actually hugely powerful, but we're only using this one technique, like these two lines right here, in order to do it. We're going to be creating a new array that is like a subset of the original array. My original array was data. We're creating a subset of it that I'm calling data just 25 which is only going to contain the rows from that original array data that had a first column that was equal to 25. Let me show you an example of that actually in my, um, in my directory here. I have been working on a little program that I'm calling example.map. Remember this is one we saw a little bit of in the previous lecture where it, at that time it just had this line here where we were loading the eight year version of the database from data slash ERG301 slash Nebraska. All right, what if I say I just want to look at the 2012 data? That seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. The year is in column two of our database. So I'm going to be creating an index array for logical indexing. I'll call it IDX. We could call it puppy dog for all that matters, but we're, we'll call it IDX just so that we recognize it's a logical index array. And it is the set of all the rows inside of data, any row, in which column two is equal equal to 2012. And the notation here is important. You do have to have it in parentheses like this. So index, or IDX anyway, will become the set of all, well, no, that's not true. Index itself will be a logical, uh, a logical indexing array. It'll just be ones and zeros, but it reflects whether or not each individual row in the data array is such that column two of that row is equal equal to 2012, okay? It's a little bit of voodoo, I understand. I'm not entirely happy with this technique either, but it's such a powerful thing for working with big data sets like this. Then I'm going to create a new array, which I'll call in this example here, data 2012. And all it is, is it's the rows in data that IDX has chosen, that are logically indexed to be true from our previous condition up here. And we want all the columns of them. Again, honestly, if you just memorized this pattern, that would be fine. How we have created an, an index, how the, t the pattern is how we did it. We set up this condition on, on, on our first array, and then we use that to create the second array on the second line. If you just memorize that pattern, it would be okay. This is not the most important thing we're learning. We need to just be able to, to use this, though, to extract data. But now look what I can do here. I can actually go ahead. Again, I was using VI instead of Nano. Nano is the text editor that most of you are using. All of some students are choosing to use VI because it's more powerful. Either way, it's just a text editor. All right, then if I go into Octave and I run this example.mat, it will load the data, and then it will do that database operation using logical indexing, where it'll extract just the observations from 2010, uh, 2012, I think we used. So if I do my who's command here, just so you can see what's going on here, you can see that I have an original array that's called data. It had 485,000 lines and rows and six columns. And then I have a new array that I call, well, for that matter, there's an array called IDX that has 485,000 rows in it by one column. It's a logical array, you'll notice, but whatever. Anyway, but notice that we've got a new array here called data 2012. And it contains a smaller number of rows because it only contains the, that fraction of the total array that has just column two is equal to 2012. It still has six columns, though, because it contains the station identifier, the year, the month, the day, the temperature maximum, the temperature minimum. I always forget which order they're in. They're either max, min, and then min, max, or the other way around. Okay. Feel free to display these variables. I mean, if I want to go ahead and say display data 2012, this will be just fine. And look what I'm getting right here. I'm getting, though, 
50 some thousand rows of station, year, month, day, maximum, and minimum. Pretty cool, huh? All right. So we can do this kind of logical indexing as a way of um, extracting. It's a database operation. We take a larger database and we are extracting values from it into a subset. We can actually then do logical indexing again on that result to further narrow it. So, for example, we can, uh, I, I said here, show station 25 in 2010. I actually have been working on a slightly different example here. I made another uh, little program here called example 2. That's the same program we've been seeing so far where I've created this array called data 2012 where I have extracted just the 2012 observations. And now I'm going to narrow my data further. I'm going to narrow my data further to just station number 506. Okay, station 506 happens to be Howells. Uh, okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another logical indexing. I'm going to make another logical index array. It doesn't hurt anything to use the same name. It doesn't, that doesn't hurt anything at all. It's going to be equal to, now I'm taking my array that was just limited to 2012, and I'm saying, yeah, but any row where column 1 is equal to 506. Okay, see so again the pattern here? The array I'm trying to limit and the condition, any row, column 1, being equal to 506. Let's be more explicit, equal, equal to 506. It's a test. I'm not saying set it equal to 506. I'm saying make it, see if it is. Again, that IDX will now be an array of uh, ones and zeros or trues and falses. I can't remember exactly how it does it. Ones and zeros, I think. Okay. But now it stores that condition. And we can then create a new array that is the result. I'll call that data howls in 2012 is equal to, now notice, it's got to be the array we got that from. This is data 2012. That was the array that we indexed. And then here's our index indices. We went all the columns from that row. We wouldn't have to have all the columns if you wanted to extract just some of them. If you just wanted the temperature max or you just wanted the temperature min, you could do that. Although I'm telling you, for the purposes of our class, you're always going to want to just keep all the, all the columns. Okay. An easy mistake to make is to not have used the right arrays here. Remember, this is the array you're pulling data out of. And that this is where you're going to put it. So here's where you're taking it out of, data 2012, and here's where you're putting it back in. So like if I go ahead and close this up and go back into Octave, and I run example 2, again it just takes a few seconds, uh, Octave's doing an enormous amount of work during that time, and if I use who's now and take a look, I have the same arrays I had before plus a new one called data owls in 2012. Uh, it's actually interesting, it is 366 rows by six columns. 366, 2012 was a leap year. So there's 366 days in the year. So we have narrowed this down to just the 366 observations that were taken in station 506, namely Howells, in 2012. And in fact, I can display that array if I feel like it. And Howells, data Howells in 2012. And uh, look, I got station 506. Oops, sorry. Station 506. 2012, January, the first, the second. Here's the maximum temperature, 3.3 uh, Celsius, and here's the minimum temperature, negative 8.3 Celsius. Pretty cool, right? I took a narrowed it just down to 2012, and then I did another operation on that array to narrow it down to just one particular station. Now I might even be able to do that further and like maybe narrow it down to just January, or narrow it down to something like that, you know, and we can start doing more and more of these kind of database operations on here. Pretty cool. There's one thing in particular, though, that you can do that is particularly useful, and that is to remove bad or missing data. This database, I have really cleaned it up quite a bit, but I deliberately left some problems in it. If I go back over here to another window, if we pull up that 8years.mat file, again, you may be working, by the time you get to the project, it's probably going to be 10 years. I think I'm going to work with 10 years. But anyway. Uh, in this version of the file here, okay, we've got station identifier, year, month, day, maximum temperature, minimum temperature that day. But if I do a search operation here, I want to show you something here. On this particular situation, station 25, 2007, December the 5th, look at the max temperature, negative 
Do you think it was really negative 999 degrees Celsius on that day? No, it's a missing observation. That negative 999.9 .9 happens to be the code they used where there was no, 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 no temperature was reported. Uh, it could be a machine problem. It could be that the person who takes these observations was gone. It, uh, most of these are done by volunteers on cooperative weather observing stations. Maybe there was, who knows, maybe data problem, who knows. So something happened here. And in fact, if you do some more searches, you'll see that there's actually a fair number of these. Out of the 480 some thousand observations that happened in the eight year period, there's about a couple hundred missing data, okay, where something happened. By the way, they're actually only in there if maximum is missing but minimum is there, or the other way around, maximum is there and minimum is missing. I actually did remove it if they missed both maximum and minimum. You know, since these are largely done by volunteers, it's often the case that, like, um, they'll have uh, been on vacation or something like that, okay? There might be like a week where there's no data at all. Okay, that, I've, I've just pulled those out. I just wanted to leave some of these in here as a little programming, uh, getting used to the way we have to work with real data in real life is there's missing observations. Well, what if you want to clean that out? How do we get, I mean, if I took the average temperature at station 27 in 2008, let's just say January, the problem is I'm going to be averaging in like a 6.1, a 5.6, an 11.7, a 11.1, trying to make the average maximum temperature, if I'm going to throw in this outlier of negative 999. Well, clearly that's not real, right? Clearly we need to remove those. Well, we can do that using logical indexing. So, for example, I could, once I, uh, I'm working on this data array uh, that we're calling data, well, one thing I can do is logical indexing where I remove the situations. I only want to keep the ones where Column five, the maximum temperature column, is greater than negative 999, okay? Because those are the only ones that are good. And then I could say like data better equals my data array, just those indices, okay? We've now thrown out any place where uh, the maximum temperature was less than negative 999, such as negative 999.9. .9. In the same way, we could process this further, we could take that data better array and say, yeah, but what about column six, the minimum temperature? What if it's, we only want the ones where it's greater than negative 999? Because we don't want the ones where the minimum temperature is missing either. And then we can make, like, I, I just called it here data clean, okay, but whatever, you could do it this however you wanted, where it could be extracting from data better just those columns, just those rows where column six was not a missing value. That's pretty slick, okay? Uh, this this logical index thing is, it's very powerful and there's lots of amazing fantasy. I got all distracted reading on uh, online about the things you can do with logical indexing. But the pattern, we're only doing one thing at this time with it, and that is this idea of how to use it, that logical indexing to extract a subset of rows from a larger, in this case, much larger array. So if you just kind of can get this pattern down as how you do this logical indexing, you'll be in good shape. And to help you understand if you do under know what this is doing, let's actually uh, see if you can answer a question about it real quick. Um, I didn't have a lot of room on this slide to make this all work the way I wanted to. Let's just say question one asks, if I had this array called data, how would I limit myself to just, like, I what would be the index array I would be creating so that I would be on the way to limiting myself to just the 2010 data? So, like, I have a line here where my IDX array is equal to, and here's some stuff, and there's a blank in there where I missed something. It's equal, equal to 2010. Is it A, colon, comma, 1, B, colon, comma, 2, C, 1, comma, colon, or D, 2, comma, colon? Which of these is the correct way to set up the index array such that it will be helping you extract just the 2010 data from our uh, data archive? Okay, make a choice from this and um, choose one of the four options below this video and we will see if you um, are right and get some feedback on the next video.